So uh, I want to thank you all for coming and I look forward to taking your questions. But before I do, I want to briefly review the experience of the United States and Minnesota economies since uh, the last recession started in December of 2007, the so-called Great Recession. And then provide my thoughts on the economic outlook for the nation. So I'm not going to provide a complete forecast for Minnesota since you relatively recently heard from uh, Toby Madden, Madden <laughs> and Rob Grunewald on that subject. Um, also, I'll add that uh, Toby and Rob will soon reissue their Minnesota job forecast. So if you have questions about that, uh, Toby will certainly be happy to talk to you about that uh, at the end of our session. So let me begin with the experience of the United States since the end of 2007, which is when the, um, the National Bureau of Economic Research dates that the, the Great Recession began, the last recession began. So the, the national economy slowed dramatically during 2008 and the first half of 2009. National output adjusted for inflation fell by 5.1% through the second quarter of 2009. And the unemployment rate, which was 5% in December of 2007, reached 10% in the second half of 2009. Now since the middle of 2009, the national economy has recovered. So the, the, the recession is dated as having ended um, in, in uh, the middle of 2009. And since that date, the national economy has recovered, but at a disappointingly moderate rate. After four years, national output uh, has finally returned to its pre-recession level, so four years after the start of the, of the recession. But returning to 2007 output levels is really a pretty low bar to set. If the economy had grown in line with historical averages, output would be roughly 10% higher today than it currently is. Now given the sluggish recovery in national output, it's not surprising that labor markets are also healing slowly. Employment fell by 8 million jobs and has recovered less than 2.5 million of those jobs. If one, uh, on an encouraging note, the unemployment rate has recently fallen to 8.3%. But if one looks at the fraction of people employed, what economists call the employment population ratio, so this is the fraction of people over the age of 16 who have a job, that uh, ratio fell by more than four percentage points during the recession and has recovered very little. Now, uh, finally, I should note that while output and employment remain quite low, inflation has re re uh, re remained remarkably close the Federal Reserve's 2% target. The um, PCE price index, personal consumption expenditure uh, price index, has averaged 1.8% annually since the start of the recession. And here I want to emphasize I'm, I'm talking about what's called the headline price index. So that's including all goods and services, not core, which sometimes, which sometimes people refer to, which uh, 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 takes out food and energy. So when I say it's average 1.8% annually, I'm actually talking about headline PC price index. Okay, so that's the, the national economy uh, picture. Um, our uh, output is recovered to uh, be now to be slightly above where we were in the fourth quarter of 2007, but still well below where we would have expected to be. Um, the economy to be at the end of 2007, where we would expect it to be today, uh, uh, according to long-run historical averages. Uh, and correspondingly, unemployment remains high and, and unemployment remains low. Um, but inflation has remained close to target. Now, the experience of Minnesota since 2007, um, I, I, so I'll start going through, go, go, go through some, some information about that. Well, Minnesota has clearly felt the pain of the recession. At the same time, our economy here in this state has weathered the recession better. State GDP numbers for 2011 are not yet available. But by 2010, the state's GDP was 1.6% above 2007 levels. While the national, as I was referring to, the national level only recovered in 2011. So by, in 2010, national GDP was still 0.3% below where we had been in, in, uh, in 2007. Now, personal income data is available through the third quarter of 2011, and it gives a similar story. Incomes have recovered faster in Minnesota than they have nationwide. Now, how does that uh, income and output data translate into jobs? 
So Minnesota entered the recession with an unemployment rate of 4.7%, slightly below the national rate of 5%. But Minnesota's unemployment rate peaked at 8.5% in mid-2009, which, if you remember back, that's well below the 10% uh, mark that we saw nationally. Now, uh, since then, the unemployment rate in Minnesota has fallen to 5.7%, so that's as of December. And that's now, that, that means that's more than uh, two and a half percentage points below the national rate. So uh, this story about the unemployment rate, that um, uh, the impact on output and on the unemployment rate of the recession in Minnesota translates into uh, what's happening in terms of the fraction of people employed as well. Um, as you likely know, Minnesota's employment population ratio has historically been considerably higher than the nation's. And that was true entering the recession. Entering the recession, the fraction of people working in Minnesota was 68.9%. And that was six percentage points higher uh, than, than the national figure of 62.7%. Now, according to the most recent data, the Minnesota ratio um, is, is lower than it was at the beginning of the recession. It's at 67.4%, and that is uh, nine percentage points, uh, nearly nine percentage points above what we see nationally. So I think the su way to summarize all this is Minnesota's economy has certainly not returned to full health, to where we were uh, 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 at the end of 2007, but I think it's, it's also safe to say that the state economy is further along, along the recovery path than the, is the national economy. So that's looking back over the last uh, four years. What about looking forward? Well, looking forward, I expect real GDP, in the, now I'm switching back to the United States, talking about the national picture, uh, I expect real GDP to grow at an annual rate between 2.5% and 3% uh, in the, uh, each of the next two years. Now, this estimate is consistent with the long-run growth track of the United States. Typically, uh, over, the, over a long period of time, uh, the real GDP grows at around 25 to 3%. And it's slightly faster than the 1.6% rate that we saw in 2011. But this 2.5% to 3% forecast, since it's consistent with the long-run growth path, it's not going to make up any of that 10% output shortfall that I mentioned earlier. To make that up, we'd have to grow faster than our long-run averages. And I'm not, I'm not expecting that over the next two years. So given this forecast of moderate GDP growth, I expect the unemployment rate to continue to fall slowly. I'm expecting to be around 7.7% by the fourth quarter of 2012 and to uh, fall to around 7% by the fourth quarter of 2013. So those, that's what I, I, uh, my expectations, my projections for uh, real GDP and for, for unemployment. In terms of inflation, I'm expecting the headline inf uh, PC inflation uh, rate to be around 2% in 2012, and I expect it to rise um, to around 2.3% in 2013, as monetary policy remains highly accommodative. Now, a quick word on Minnesota's outlook. So forecasting is, is difficult enough at the national level, and uh, I, 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 really shouldn't, I, I really have to underscore that statement. Um, that uh, these are forecasts, forecasts have error, and it's, it's always important to keep that in mind. Forecasting the state level is even more, uh, I think, uh, challenging. Um, as all of you know, and as I just uh, uh, talked about, I think Minnesota has been a little ahead of the national recovery curve. I expect it to continue, but I think that uh, uh, in terms of details on that, you should wait a couple of weeks and you'll get the details from our, our regional forecast. So that's what I had to cover uh, in terms of my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. I'm with the Pioneer Press, Jimmy Forster. Um, why is Minnesota, can you kind of break it down why you think Minnesota is recovering faster than the nation, why our unemployment rate is lower in the, pop, the employment population ratio is better than the, the nation? Could we just go into recession earlier? Um, so that's, that's a good question. I think that uh, in general, uh, so this is a sort of part of a general pattern that I think that um, Minnesota fares somewhat better in recessions than the national economy, although we, we tend to, to move in a recession and come out of recession roughly at the same time. Um, 
You know, we, we, this is a question that we've, we've spent a fair amount of time answering and I, I trying, to, trying to answer. And I, I don't think, I, I would certainly uh, say that the answer I'm going to offer you is not a definitive one at this point by any means. I think research is going to continue on this. But I think that if you look at our, uh, the uh, level of education that we have in our labor force, it's a little higher um, than, um, maybe a little more than a little higher than we see nationally. And I think that helps insulate us against uh, recessions. If you look at uh, what's happened with the unemployment rate for educated uh, uh, folks, um, it, it's gone up, but it hasn't gone up as much as uh, uh, those uh, uh, for people who, for example, who have only have a high school education as opposed to having a college one or, or for people who don't have a high school, educa uh, high school degree at all. That's one story. I think another part for this particular recession is that um, the behavior of uh, um, what's happened to our house prices was not as dramatic as has happened in some other parts of the country. And I think that's a, a part of what also is going on. For this particular recession, the behavior of our, uh, our, our, um, our, our home prices, the fact they didn't go up as much, didn't come, uh, come down quite as much as what's going on nationally, I think that's been, been uh, part of the picture as well in Minnesota. Annie. Um, so you mentioned that you expect uh, headline inflation to rise to 2.3% in 2013. Um, so that, that is higher than what the, the Fed's target of 2% is, right? I mean, it, are, are you still, you're still feeling, I mean, I know you, you've expressed this publicly before that you, you thought that maybe the policy was too accommodative uh, and that we did run a, an inflation risk. Can you tell me what you're thinking about that right now? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> And I'm glad you asked. Um, no, I think I think that uh, so so let me uh, uh, I'll probably be overly long uh, compared to what you want in answering this, but because uh, it's certainly something I spend a lot of time thinking about. The I think uh, my concerns in, in 2011 about monetary policy was a, were about um, the responsiveness of the changes in policy to the evolution of economic conditions, and in particular, what we saw in 2011 was that um, inflation had risen, the outlook for inflation had risen, and um, unemployment had fallen and the outlook for unemployment had fallen. So um, both of those changes would lead one to, given, given our dual mandate, which is to promote price stability, um, keep inflation um, around 2%, and to promote maximum employment, uh, those changes where we're sort of doing better on both of our mandates would lead one to expect that, the, um, the, the, that we would reduce the level of monetary accommodation we're providing, the, 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 uh, the Fed is providing. That didn't happen. The, the, the Fed decided to go in a, a different direction in 2011, both at the August meeting and at the September meeting, to, uh, to increase the level of accommodation. Then in the January meeting where I was, um, you know, who was a voting member of the committee changes from year to year, and this year I'm not a voter, so I didn't vote on the, on the decision in January. And uh, at the January meeting, um, there were the, the, uh, uh, the committee chose to make the stance of monetary policy even more accommodative. They did that by uh, saying that they now expect the Fed funds rate will stay extraordinarily low um, through uh, um, late 2014, as opposed to what had been said earlier, which is through mid-2013. So this is saying that... We're, the, the, the uh, Fed anticipates keeping rates extraordinarily low for 18 months longer than they had stated earlier. At least, all, I, I should say, uh, just by way of, uh, all these statements all were made about at least. So it's at least through mid-2014, and the previous statement was at least through mid-2013. So this is, but this is a chance to, this is an att certainly an attempt to become more accommodative monetary policy. Yeah, I, I think it's you know I think it's uh, it's challenging at this stage to to think about what what exactly are the inflationary risks. But I, I, I my own stance on this, my own uh, thinking on this is that you know what keeps inflation down. The thinking of why inflation is low, even though we're, we're we have so much monetary accommodation in place, has to do with what economists call slack. That is, how many resources aren't being used up. If you don't have a lot of extra resources, a, a lot of people are unemployed, for example that are available for firms to hire, you'd expect there to be downward pressure on prices from that. And the Fed's providing accommodation is an attempt to generate higher output and also to keep prices high by, uh, in the face of those downward pressures. The qu big question for economists right now is, what is slack? What is that downward pressure? So uh, we've talked about the unemployment rate, still uh, quite high at 8.3% nationally. But there's a lot of measures of slack that don't 
uh, that looked very consistent with uh, what we saw, say, in mid-2004. And here I'm thinking about capacity utilization, which is a measure of how much um, um, uh, of available capacity firms are actually using right now. That looks pretty much the same right now as it did in mid-2004. If you look at the short-term unemployment rate, the fraction of people who have been unemployed for six months or less, that's very similar to where we were in mid-2004. If you look at the average weekly hours that um, firms are using available, their, their, their existing employees, that also looks roughly the same as mid-2004. So a combinated monetary policy right now, what's it trying to do? It's trying to, um, um, it's trying to lower the longer-term unemployment rate. That remains very high, the fraction of people who have un been unemployed for lo longer than six months. So by, by accommodating monetary policy is trying to do that and, all, uh, and or trying to raise um, the, the people, try to bring people out for who are out of the labor force now, not looking for, trying to bring them back. I think the costs, the trade-offs of that are, are uh, likely to be ones that are going to ref uh, be reflective in the kind of inflation numbers that I, that I that I, I uh, offered you in my opening remarks, that we're going to have to pay some costs in terms of inflation if we're going to go down this path of using accommodative monetary policy to, to go after long-term unemployment or try to bring people back in the labor force who, who are not currently in the labor force. Can I ask just one quick follow-up question to that? Just, I want, do you think that the Fed has the ability to, to back off of that? that I mean, how, how, how steadfast is that promise to hold? Oh, I, I think the Fed, um, the, the the Fed's uh, statement, I think, should be interpreted as a, uh, a projection, a forecast of where they anticipate policy to stay. Um, and so the, the, certainly the Fed has the ability to change policy. Uh, at the same time, I think when you offer that, con these ki that kind of projection in your formal statement, um, I think you're, you're deliberately trying to make it a little more challenging to change policy. So it's not impossible to change policy, but I think by offering that st the, the statement in the, in, in the, in the uh, FOMC statement, as the, the Fed did in, uh, in January, as the committee did in January, I, I think you're trying to create uh, uh, some cost for yourself in going out and raising rates later on if, in, in case you want to. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. D to pass with the Star Tribune. Um, I like your, your economic forecast on the unemployment side. Do you have an idea of where the jobs are going to come, or do you have an idea of sector placement with regard to future job growth? You know, I'm not going to be able to offer much on that beyond uh, sort of the usual things that you get out of the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I mean, I think that, uh, so, I, so I, I guess the safest thing for me to say is, you know, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics a website, they offer some forecasts about, about where, where, where you're likely to see sectoral growth. Um, and the, those are, tend to be a little more longer term. You know, in the short term, certainly we've seen, you know, manufacturing done, has done very well in this recovery. It, it got hit very hard in the recession, so we're coming off of a low base. But I think we're going to, you know, that's something that we've seen over the last uh, um, uh, two, two, uh, uh, since the end of the re end of the uh, recession in 2009, and I, I suspect that'll that'll continue. But I, uh, I think this for the sectoral breakdown, the BLS is probably a better source. Yeah. Jennifer Bjorn, let's start. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> tell us more about your decision to start holding these um, briefings, and how often you can expect them. And well, that's a great question. I mean, um, I, I I think that it's uh, that's an ongoing process. We'll think about it, but it, certainly I'm a very pro-transparency person, and I think it's it's useful to um, get out to the talk to the public about what I'm expecting. And and I thought the conversation you just had with Annie about how how my policy outlook is going to be shaped by my own personal outlook for the economy. I think that's that's very important for the public to be engaged in that. So I don't have a definitive answer for you right now on that, but uh, it's certainly something we're thinking about exactly how frequently to do this. Um, the, I'm Tom Mason at Northwestern Financial Review Magazine. So the president has just proposed a budget, and I'm wondering if you can offer any comments to help us understand the relationship between fiscal policy and what that means for the Fed in determining monetary policy. Yeah, I, so, the, the, you know, we, so at a broad level, you know, fiscal policy matters because it's, it's a set, I'm going to use an overly techie economist word, the term exogenous. So it's basically stuff that's outside of our control. It's one of the bunch of things that are outside our control. You know, uh, um, uh, uh, it's, it, we have to think about that. How, you know, we have to think about not just what the president's proposed, 
you know, how likely is it going to be to be implemented in law. There's going to be a dialogue between the President and Congress about that. And then that'll shape, so have some impact on uh, the background for our, our economy. You know, at a broader level, um, I think it's important for, um, there's, there's some long-term structural issues in the, the, the U.S. fiscal situation in terms of the obligations that uh, uh, both implicit and explicit we've made to, to our older citizens in particular, and um, the tax base as it currently exists. And that, that tension is going to have to be resolved. Um, and it, I think it's, uh, Chairman Bernanke has emphasized this in the past, I think it's exactly right. It is a longer term issue, but the sooner we get some resolution about how that longer term uh, issue is going to be resolved, um, uh, either by raising taxes or, or reducing the obligations, that's going to be better for the economy. But that's, that's basically how, how, how that influences, I think, the, the way we think about uh, fiscal policy. Brad. Uh, Brad Allen from MinPost. You, talk, you describe yourself as a pro-transparency kind of guy. And you, uh, last October, you came out with this mandate dashboard, and now the Fed seems to have adopted, or Chairman Bernanke seems to have adopted some form of that in communicating sort of the ranges of Fed actions. Um, in the deliberations at the Fed, and in your own mind, how important is this sort of new, relatively new mode of, of the Fed being more transparent in terms of setting market expectations as opposed to, or I guess in concert with, the Fed is now very much part of the, the political discourse. You know, there's uh, calls in Congress for, for uh, Fed audits and whatnot. And so how much of it, how much of the Fed transparency is, is trying to gain sort of market uh, calming effects as opposed to sort of dealing with the political issue in your mind? Yeah, the political issue, I can only speak for myself, and as always, I'm only speaking for myself and nobody else in the system or in the, on the FOMC. So, but let me, I'll take, try to step back and take it to a higher level of the question. So, um, I, you know, the, the, uh, the FOMC has, in, in January, um, made a step, a couple of, I think, uh, important steps in terms of uh, uh, enhancing transparency. One was to, I think, articulate in a clear, sharp way what our long-run operating framework is, and, and which included, among other things, a, a, a clear statement that our, our target for inflation is 2%, which I think uh, was, is important for people to understand what that number is. Um, and there are other aspects that we, I, I'm happy to talk more about. It's also true that the, the Fed is now, uh, the meeting participants, FOMC participants, are now offering projections for what they would view as appropriate policy. So that is, when do you think, how long do you think the Fed funds rate is going to be remain as low as it is? Um, that's summarized. But I should be clear about that. That's what's being, uh, being provided is 17, there are 17 participants at the FOMC meeting. We're providing each person's own separate evaluation of where that, that Fed funds rate is going to be going. Uh, it, excuse me, it's where it would be going if they were in charge. <laughs> That's, that's the, con the key condition. It's, it's what they view as appropriate policy. So w if they were in charge of monetary policy, where they would be, be uh, thinking about the Fed funds rate going. Now, why is the Fed doing these things? I think there's a couple of different reasons. One is I think that uh, Chairman Bernanke in particular, but there are other members of the committee, m many of us on the committee also feel this way, think that monetary policy is both more effective and more, uh, more accountable the more transparent you are about where you think it's going to be going. So in terms of the effectiveness part, monetary policy doesn't work through what the level of interest rates are today. It works through where people expect interest rates are going to be going in the future. It's not the one-day interest rate today that matters. It's the three-year interest rate or the 30-year interest rate that, that matters more. And the Fed, by offering a forecast of where um, expects policy to be going, either through the statement or through the individual member's projections, um, is able to offer some guidance on that. I think that's effective at any time. Helps monetary policy be more effective at any point. And you see a lot of central banks around the world trying to offer the same kind of uh, perspective on where they think policy is going to be going in the future. Um, so I, I, I think that that's, that, uh, I think it's important at any time, but it's especially important when you're, you're uh, policy tool is as constrained as ours is. So because interest rates are as low as they are right now, we can't really make them go any lower. So a key question for, for financial market participants is, 
how, how long are you planning to keep them at the, um, at the, at, at, as low as they are? And that's the kind of information the Fed is trying to provide through this, through its statement. On the political side, yeah, I, I, it's not, so, that's, I'll speak for myself, that's not why I find these, these kinds of emissions attractive, except so far as I think in general, regardless of what kind of, um, you know, the political, the, the political dialogue of the moment, it's always good for the central bank to be, be transparent about these kinds of matters because uh, independence is not opaqueness. <laughs> uh, I think we can maintain and foster our independence by being, being transparent about, about our decision making. Yeah. I'm Mark Anderson, I'm with Finance and Commerce newspaper. Uh, what, what is impeding faster growth now? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think this is a good question. I mean, I think there's, I, I th when I think about the economy, I think there's a couple of different key forces that are that are at work, um, and that one is on the on the and they both they both start from the same place, which is that there's been a lot of damage to, to, to household balance sheets, um, a lot of loss in wealth that people are in particular coming from housing. Um, there's some from the stock market as well, but largely from housing. People taking a huge hit in, the, in terms of the value of the land they own. That, that affects the economy in a couple of different ways. One is it affects the economy in terms of how much people want to buy, how many goods they want to go out and buy, how much, how much they demand. If they don't buy, demand that much, then firms aren't going to be in, 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 have to hire as many workers. So there's going to be downward pressure on unemployment. So that's one force that's out there. There's another force that's out there, I think, that um, the uh, the fact that people have lost wealth, people have lost, let nor less lost net worth, I think that makes it more challenging for them to um, initiate new businesses, obtain the credit, to, to have the, the net worth that they need to be putting into those businesses that banks usually demand them to do. Without that, without those startups, without the, those new businesses, that's, a, that's an a impediment to hiring because those new businesses are a big, big, big source typically of, of of, of new hires. So both of these I think are, are impediments. Uh, there they're also seems to be true that in the labor market firms are finding it more challenging than they did in 2007 to find workers that they view as appropriate for given jobs. This is sometimes given this global name of mismatch. That's another factor that's, that's going on. So as usual there's multiple factors that I think that are, that are at work. Brad. Given the, um, the sort of unemployment rate being above where it has been, but the economy has started to grow again, is the economy more productive and therefore maybe unemployment uh, or employment is going to be at a different level than it was previous recession? It's a great question. We're going to have, I mean, it's, I, I've, you know, I, we're asked in the, the, the economic projections we provide as federal, uh, FOMC members, we, um, um, we're asked to offer a, a, a longer term, five to six year out kind of forecast for unemployment. And I feel relatively confident about that. The forecasts range, uh, the central tendency for those forecasts between 5.2 and 6 percent. I think that's a, I feel com comfortable with that. I think it's much more challenging to answer the question you pose about employment. Where are we going to be in the longer term for that? Um, I, I, so I, 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 you know, in, in, I, I, in uh, late 2007, uh, the fraction of people who had jobs, the fraction of people over 16 who had jobs was 62.7%. Right now that number is down around 58.5%. I don't think we're going to be coming back to 62.7%. Now part of that's demographics, just the aging of the population over 16 is going to make, you know, lead people to choose not to be working. But part of it is, I think, other more structural forces in the economy. You, you were saying that the, you know, the, the, the FOMC is now pushing out by 18 months uh, its target for, for uh, keeping that Fed funds rate low. Um, and, and you were already kind of critical of the 2013 deadline, right? So, so this, I mean, and it is, it, maybe you just, you could just explain it. I mean, is, is there some logic? What is the logic there? I mean, is there, are there any merits to this plan? And is it ex exclusively tied to the unemployment, high unemployment rate? Or, I mean, let me just understand it. Yeah, you know, I, I, so it is always a dangerous business to try to articulate 
<laughs> First of all, it's hard enough to explain your own ideas, let alone trying to explain the ideas of others. But I, I, I will uh, venture into that. I think if you look at uh, the projections the FOMC provided in January, in January um, those projections show that um, the central tendency of the committee think that uh, inflation is going to remain below target and that unemployment is going to remain above what they see it going to in the longer term. Um, those conditions, I think, lead them to, to think that it's a, a, a good idea to, to provide the ad additional accommodation that they, they did in January. Do, do you think the costs of this accommodation are worth it? You said the cost is inflation. Is, is it worth it? it I, I think that we should be much more clear about our operating framework along those dimensions than we have been. Uh, this is something I, I talked about in the fall to, to some of you that um, I think we should be clear uh, with ourselves and with the public about what are the trade-offs that we see between inflation and unemployment among a, a given action that we take on and you know why are we willing to to undertake the given action given those, those trade-offs. Um, I think we've made some good steps in terms of transparency in terms of the, the things I talked about but I think, I think being clear about our, um, about our framework along the lines I've just described uh, would be helpful. I think what makes it challenging right now is some of the things I talked about with Annie at the, earlier, which is um, the, where is the uh, slack the, the, uh, uh, in, in resource utilization, where is that showing up? And it's showing up in longer term unemployment. It's showing, and showing up in the fact that people are not in the labor force. I think those costs, those trade-offs, are more are likely to be different than we typically face when we think about using monetary policy. So that is, it's going to be, it's going to require more inflation to generate inroads into those kinds of that kind of of, of um, underutilization of, of resources than short-term unemployment or or low capacity usage. I think it's going to be. Um, I think that the trade-off uh, between um, inflation and unemployment, given that, given that we're trying to, when you use mon accommodated monetary policy right now, and you're going after the, trying to, trying to foster maximum employment, promote maximum employment, you're really trying to get people who are out of the labor force back into the labor force and getting a job, and you're trying to reduce the longer term unemployment rate, the fraction of people who have been unemployed for longer than six months. I think that the trade-off in terms of how much inflation you would need to make inroads into those numbers is uh, different, likely more challenging than when you think about using monetary policy, how much inflation you would need to bring down short-term unemployment. Is, I'm sorry. is part of that trade-off the reduced amount of income that retired folks can rely on? I mean, retired folks need a certain amount of, the interest rates to be at a certain level so they can you know, enjoy interest income, which they're not enjoying right now. I mean, is that part of the trade-off? That's, I think, um, no, I, I think about it more in terms of, so, so let me talk a little bit about that, that issue. I, you know, there's always an issue when, with low interest rates. Low interest rates are the channel we use to, try, to stimulate the economy, to stimulate the men in the economy. Um, that trade-off is, and so there's, low interest rates are, um, more beneficial for borrowers than they are for savers. On net, this policy has an overall positive effect on demand, and that's going to it's going to push upward on demand. No, it's the trade-off that I'm, I'm thinking about more is when demand goes up, that's going to push upward on prices, but also lead firms to hire. So it pushes upward on inflation, but also pushes upward on on employment. The question is, how much inflation do you have to generate in order to bring uh, people back out who are out of the labor force back into it or people who have been unemployed for longer than six months to get them to have a job. That trade-off may well be different than when you think about the trade-off between people uh, getting people who have been unemployed for less than six months to have a job. Yeah. In your um, own remarks that you've made to the FOMC, have, have you come up with any sort of uh, hypotheses about how to quantify what the economic cost would be to having higher inflation? But is there a particular hit to GDP that you have in mind that this would potentially generate? Or, I mean, how, how would you? Well, I, I, think, I think it's a very challenging question because a, uh, you know, having a inflation run at 2.3% for one year is not hugely costly in my mind. 
the cost you, you suffer is the loss of trust. You know, people start to see inflation creeping upward, upward. We just issued this statement saying that the numerical target for inflation is 2%. It's very important for us, for us to maintain that kind of, uh, the, their trust and confidence that we will actually do that. That anchors longer term expectations for inflation, keeps inflation low. It also allows us to be more effective in terms of, 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 of um, stimulating employment and stimulating demand in the, in the short term. So if we, uh, I, what con the concern is more over the medium term that if you uh, go down this path that you're going to see realization of inflation that will trigger a lack of trust in the central bank's ability or willingness to, to keep that 2% target. So it's not any, you know, it's not any given moment in time. It's more over the course of time, what, what are you trying to do and, uh, and, 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 and maintaining people's confidence in, in that. And, and so if you're correct and, and inflation does go to 2.3% in 2013, but given the Fed's statement, you feel that the, that the FOMC would continue to maintain very low interest rates and that they would not alter their, uh, their policy as inflation moves up? That, that is my expectation. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. The reduction of the unemployment rate from 8.3 to the forecasted 7%, how much should we look at the policy, the monetary policy is influencing that decline? And how much is it it's just out of, you know, out of Fed policy or just normal? Yeah, the, there's a good questions and that's, that's hard to, to know. I think, I think it's, it's always challenging to know for a given change in the economy how much to assign to monetary policy. I think people typically over-ascribe uh, the effect, they, they, uh, they are, um, tend to uh, inflate the importance of monetary policy. Um, so I, I think that the, uh, some of the, the decline in unemployment is coming from the fact that we have been successfully uh, following these kinds of accommodative policies. Um, I think, I think one way to see that is, uh, the way I like to see it is more through the inflation rate, um, that the kinds of shocks that we've seen, um, especially the wealth shock that I talked through, would be generally, you'd think, push very hard downward on demand and push very hard downward on prices. So you would have thought you would see inflation running well below 2%, and that would have led to very high unemployment if we'd seen that. In fact, we've kept inflation pretty close to 2%. And that's been helpful, I think, in terms of keeping unemployment from going any higher. But in terms of just going down from 8.3 to 7.7, .7, you know, I think monetary policy is playing a role. But I think, it's, uh, I think a lot of that is just is the recovery process at work, the natural recovery process of the economy. Is that part of why you're skeptical about using the short term the low interest rates as a, even further as a tool to lower unemployment? Because you don't think that it I mean, do you think that that, that emphasis is exaggerated, that it actually can? Well, I, you know, I, I think that the, the cost, we have to be clear, I think we should be clear with ourselves and with the public about what these trade-offs are going to be between inflation and unemployment, especially given uh, where we stand in terms of resource utilization, given the kind of resource utilization patterns I've described, where by many measures, in terms of resource utilization, we're back to mid-2004, and inflation looks about the same as it did in mid-2004. And that was a period when the Fed was actually had a much less accommodative policy and was actually tightening. Um, can you say anything about business investment and, and triggers you see to uh, help uh, re revive uh, business investment over the next couple of years? Yeah, I think that. Um, the, I think we're seeing, you know, we're certainly investment is recovered, you know, or is in the process of recovery. Um, you know, I think that the, the um, I think as people get more confidence in the sustainability of the recovery, we're gonna, it's, it becomes a sort of a self-fulfilling thing that as people get more confidence in the pace of recovery, I think that, I think that we're gonna, you know, that'll have, have beneficial impacts on, on business investment. Um, but you know, I have to say that my uh, my forecast is sort of is consistent with our staying on a longer run growth. It's consistent with our uh, growth being at the uh, 
tracking the long run level, right? So it's, it's not like we're going to see, it's not consistent with business investment exploding or anything like that. Um, I, I just was curious if you could comment a little bit on bank lending and access to capital and how you expect the monetary policy to maybe finally be successful or not successful in pushing that along. You know, I think that um, um, bank, we, we, we talked to, to banks on an ongoing basis about, uh, about the, the relatively low lending, you know, the lending growth in, in uh, um, Minnesota, in, in, within, our, within our district in particular, lending growth has been low, but it's certainly been low throughout the country. And um, a lot of that, I think, is tied to uh, demand considerations. That is, that um, businesses, there's, I think, two factors. One is that this, this kind of issue that I pointed to earlier, that um, um, cer certainly uh, incipient businesses, startup businesses, don't have the kind of net worth, the kind of collateral, the kind of uh, kind of access to, to resources that they would need to start up start up start up new businesses. So that's, that's going to drive down on demand. On the other hand, I think there's also uh, an issue about the level of confidence, the level of output, the level of demand going forward for products that are leading firms not to demand loans from 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 banks. So I think a lot of this is um, it's always hard to sort it out. Is it coming from the fact that banks have become much more conservative, <laughs> or is it coming from the fact that people aren't asking for money? On net, or offer, offer guarded, uh, more, I would lean more on the demand side. And I think, again, as we, we see more strength in the economy, more confidence in the economy, the, 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 the sustainability of the recovery, I think we're gonna, we'll see more loan growth. I have a follow-up to that question. I, I can't remember who the economist was, but I recall someone said after the last set of national job numbers were out um, that some of that job growth was due to increased lending. That, that that, uh, that was kind of you know, sparking more hiring, businesses were able to borrow more. Are you seeing any evidence of that just yet? I, I, you know, I think all these things go together, you know, and, and uh, so it's, it's always hard to sort out causation. All, uh, this is all about the recovery process ongoing. And it, certainly the job growth um, is a, um, it's it's a part of the. It was a good sign that we saw the job numbers we saw in January. It's only one month of numbers, but it was a good, certainly good good news, and I think that does um, uh, it does circle. I, I I think all the, it's it's a mistake I think to try to point to one number and saying it's causing a number. Uh, it, all these things are are really moving together. Whenever we hear that unemployment statistic, though. It's always a little bit cloudy in the sense that the number of people in the labor force is declining, and you pointed that out in your comments. And I'm just wondering, what can you tell us to help us, you know, gauge, you know, where we're really at? Yeah, I think I think I think the answer um, is that it depends, and what it, what does it depend on? I was I, I when I think about those numbers, I think about it through the lens as a monetary policymaker. What can I try to influence? And I think it's much more challenging for me to think through how to, how to affect labor market indicators that are sort of broader than the unemployment rate. In particular, we've seen a decline in labor force participation. But I, I, I think it's very challenging to think through how monetary policy, is, those kinds of changes tend to be more structural in nature when you see that kind of decline. It's harder to see how monetary policy is going to be effective at, that, at, at, at remediating that. So I, that's why I tend to use unemployment as being my marker of how we're doing on the employment mandate. Um, you know, it's, it, other, other people who have other policy levers to think about might have a broader perspective on what's going on in the economy. But as a monetary policymaker, I think unemployment does a, the unemployment rate does a, the best possible job of, of summarizing where we're at. Now, with that said, you know, my, my opening remarks, I talked about how employment population is low relative to where we were in, in December 2007. It is something as an economist, as a citizen, we should be thinking about. Now, the people who are working have to support a lot more people than they did in, uh, <laughs> in December 2007. That's a concern for the, for the country, certainly. You've uh, been a president of the Fed now almost two years, I guess. And um, uh, the, the ninth district has both uh, North Dakota, which has the lowest unemployment rate, and, and the Upper Peninsula, which is, has amongst the highest. 
can you reflect, and you, you've talked about what surprised you the most is the slow pace of recovery. I'm just curious of, of, about what you've learned about the ninth, or can you reflect on what, um, what surprised you the most about uh, stepping into this role in the, in the ninth? Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's, uh, I, I, there's, there's sort of certainly a learning curve about the ninth district economy. Um, that that uh, that I've been on, and you know, it, it is a very big geographic area. Despite the, the the relatively small number of people who live here, we have my population is the smallest district um, <coughs> by uh, area, the second largest. So there's a lot of heterogeneity. I think that <coughs> you've sp spoken about just between North Dakota and the Upper Peninsula, but I, I think that um, I, I you know I think that. There, it's, it, it, until I had this job, I had, was, would not have had as a full appreciation of the heterogeneity that exists. Even between eastern Montana and western Montana, you'll see heterogeneity in economic experiences. We're talking about a state with <coughs> a population of you know, less than a million people, but you'll still see that kind of heterogeneity. And I, I think at times, and I'm guilty of this myself, at times when you, you talk only about the aggregate numbers, the national economy's numbers, you're missing that, 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 um, that more diverse picture. That if we go down by states or even by um, counties or regions, I think I think it's a, I, I think we see a, a more diverse experience. Annie, yeah, yeah. Okay. sorry. There were um, a couple months in a row that um, consumer credit outstanding was up really significantly in November and December. Um, is that a good sign? I know you're hesitant usually to make too much out of just the moment. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you offer the caveat yourself. I think that there's, um, there's a confidence level that that shows that speaks well for consumer spending going forward. Um, but I think it would be a mis I, 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 my outlook is for long, for growth over the next two years to be around two and a half to three percent. That's about the long, long run uh, level. To, to that's and I, I don't see those consumer spending numbers as being inconsistent with that forecast. To make the kind of uh, real inroads of the fast inroads in unemployment or the to, the to make inroads in that 10% shortfall I talked about at the beginning, you're going to need more than, more than that kind of growth rate. I don't didn't see that in those numbers. I saw that as just being the kind of bouncing around that I would expect over the long run of the long run growth path. Mark, I think, had went for, got for the first. Sorry. Uh, you talked a little bit about personal, personal income data, um, uh, recent personal income data recovery. Um, but do you, do you have any uh, uh, data or understanding at this point of the jobs that are are, 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 are coming back into, into the market, uh, what their uh, compensation is like, and, and whether that's uh, eroding uh, some of these, the opportunities for growth, whether the jobs that people are, are taking on now that You know, I can speak. I'll speak only in broad terms about that. There's a lot of work uh, going back many years in economics, to, uh, in the, uh, in economic research, to show that um, when people lose their jobs and are displaced and take on new jobs, there's definitely a wage loss associated with that. And I, um, that I'm sure that 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 kind of experience is being being endured by many in this in this episode. Jennifer. Thanks. My question was kind of related. It was about personal income, but do you are there really clear and obvious reasons why personal income might be growing faster here? In well, I, I think it comes back to this question of why, which maybe you asked earlier. I've forgotten who asked it earlier. But but um, about why Minnesota has done better in the, the recession. And I, you know, I think that um, having higher levels of education, like we do, helps insulate us. And um, I think that the fact that um, we didn't have as much of uh, sort of the impact of the housing run up and run down as some other parts of the country has helped as well to uh, insulate us uh, from the, the, the kind of movements in demand that, that the other parts of the country are, are, are going through. I'm going to take one more. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the skill, skills mismatch that you had um, referred to earlier? Is that, how much of that do you think is responsible for higher unemployment rate? And um, if why can't why don't firms just if they 
don't see labor out there, skilled labor, why don't they increase wages? Or just take on the training themselves? So I, I, you know, I, I, there's a lot of, I think this is an ongoing research issue that, that about how much, it's a good question, but it's also a difficult question to answer about how much, how much is really out there. Um, I, I, so what we see is that the number of uh, vacancies that firms are posting is um, relatively low compared to uh, what you would expect it to be given how many unemployed people are out there. <laughs> and there's, a, there's certainly a couple of ways to, to cast that data. One is that, and we hear this from firms anecdotally, that it's harder for them to find the kind of workers that they, they would like for a given job. The, and so when it's harder to do something, that's going to lead you to do less of it. Okay? So it's more costly to go find the right worker for a job. You might post for your vacancies as a result of that. Um, but there's another way to spin it, which is firms have very low demand for their products, and so that, that's leading them to uh, post fewer vacancies as a result. Sorting out how much is due to which, I think, is certainly an ongoing, ongoing thing. So I, I, I wouldn't ha I'll be able to offer a definitive number on that, but it is, I, I, it is a source, but how much of a source, I think, is, is, is hard to know. So you're suggesting that they, if, if they thought it were going to be easier to hire people, they actually would post those vacancies more often, but they're sort of just giving up on bothering? Is that kind of it? Well, it's more, co if, it's, if you pay, uh, searching for people is hard, and so if, um, if, uh, if your uh, ability to find people is somehow impeded by what's going on in the, in the uh, job market, then you're going to do less of that activity. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.